and that the purpose of this layer, the sub-base or base of course, is to transfer the weight of the road and its traffic to the ground, while protecting the ground from deformation by spreading the weight evenly. Therefore, the sub-base did not have to be a self-supporting structure. The upper running surface provided a smooth surface for vehicles, while protecting the large stones of the sub-base. Dr. Seguet understood the importance of drainage by providing deep side ditches, but he insisted on building its roads in trenches so that they could be accessed from the sides, which undermined this principle. Well-maintained surfaces and drains protect the integrity of the sub-base, and Tusseguet introduced a system of continuous maintenance, where a roadman was allocated a section of road to be kept up to a standard dot, 28, Telford. The surveyor and engineer Thomas Telford made substantial advances in the engineering of new roads and the construction of bridges. His method of road building involved digging a large trench in which a foundation of heavy rock was set. He designed his roads so that they sloped downwards from the center. Thomas Telford, the colossus of the roads in early 19th century Britain, crowned slope, allowing drainage to take place, a major improvement on the work of Tussequet. The surface consisted of broken stone. He improved on methods for the building of roads by improving the selection of stone based on thickness, taking into account traffic, alignment and slopes. During his later years Telford was responsible for rebuilding sections of the London to Holyhead Road, a task completed by his assistant of 10 years, John McNeil. His engineering work on the Holyhead Road, now the A5. In the 1820s reduced the journey time of the London mail coach from 45 hours to just 27 hours, and the best mail coach speeds rose from 5 to 6 miles per hour, 8-10 kilometers per hour, to 9 to 10 miles per hour, 14-16 kilometers per hour. Between London and Shrewsbury, most of his work on the road amounted to our improvements. Beyond Shrewsbury, and especially beyond Langolin, the work often involved building a highway from scratch. Notable features of this section of the route include the Waterloo Bridge across the River Conwy at Bitswyko Ed, the ascent from there to Capel Curig and then the descent from the Nant Francon Pass towards Bangor. Between Capel Curig and Bethesda, in the Ogwen Valley, Telford divided from the original road, built by Romans during their occupation of this area. 29. Macadam. It was another Scottish engineer, John Loudon Macadam, who designed the first modern roads. He developed an inexpensive paving material of soil and stone aggregate, known as Macadam. His road building method was simpler than Telford's yet more effective at protecting roadways. He discovered that massive foundations of rock upon rock were unnecessary and asserted that native soil alone would support throat and traffic upon it, as long as it was covered by a road crust that would protect the soil underneath from water and wear. 30. Construction of the first macadamized road in the United States, 1823. In the foreground, Workers were breaking stones so as not to exceed 6 ounces in weight or to pass a 2-inch ring. 31. Unlike Telford and other road builders, Macadam lay its roads as level as possible. His 30-foot wide, 9.1 m, road required only a rise of 3 inches from the edge to the center. Cambering and elevation of the road above the water table enabled rainwater to run off in toddiches on either side. 32. Size of stones was central to Macadam's road building theory. The lower 200 mm, 7.9 in, row thickness was restricted to stones no larger than 75 mm, 3.0 in. The upper 50 mm, 2.0 in, layer of stones was limited to 20 mm, 0.79 in, size and stones were checked by supervisors who carried scales.
a workman could check the stone size himself by seeing if the stone would fit into his mouth. The importance of the 20mm stone size was that the stones needed to be much smaller than the 100 width of the iron carriage wheels that traveled on the road. McAdam believed that the proper method of breaking stones for utility and rapidity was accomplished by people sitting down and using small hammers, breaking the stones so that none was larger than 6 ounces in weight. He wrote that the quality of the road would depend on how carefully the stones were spread on the surface over a sizable space, one shovel full at a time. 33. McAdam directed that no substance that would absorb water and affect the road by frost should be incorporated into the road, neither was anything to be laid on the clean stone to bind the road. The action of road traffic would cause the broken stone to combine with its own angles, merging into a level, solid surface that would withstand weather or traffic. 34. Through his road building experience, McAdam had learned that a layer of broken angular stones would act as a solid mass and would not require the large stone layer previously used to build roads. By keeping the surface stones smaller than the wheel width, a good running surface could be created for traffic. The small surface stones also provided low stress on the road, so long as they could be kept reasonably dry. 35. In practice, his roads proved to be twice as strong as Stilford's roads. 36. Although McAdam had been adamantly opposed to the filling of the voids between his small cut stones with smaller material, in practice road builders began to introduce filler materials such as smaller stones sand and clay, and it was observed that these roads were stronger as a result. McAdam roads were being built widely in the United States and Australia in the 1820s and in Europe in the 1830s and 1840s. 37. McAdam roads were adequate for use by horses and carriages or coaches, but they were very dusty and subject to erosion with heavy rain. Modern roads. Modes of road transport in Dublin 1929 The Good Roads movement occurred in the United States between the late 1870s and the 1920s. Advocates for improved roads led by bicyclists such as the League of American Wheelmen turned local agitation into a national political movement. Outside cities, roads were dirt or gravel consisting of mud in the winter and dusty in the summer. Early organizers cited Europe where road construction and maintenance was supported by national and local governments. In its early years, the main goal of the movement was education for road building in rural areas between cities and to help rural populations gain the social and economic benefits enjoyed by cities where citizens benefited from railroads, trolleys and paved streets. Even more than traditional vehicles. The newly invented bicyclists could benefit from good country roads. Later on, McAdam. Roads did not hold up to higher speed motor vehicle use. Methods to stabilize roads with tar date back to at least 1834 when John Henry Castle, operating from Castle's patent lava stone works in Millwall, patented pitch McAdam. 38. This method involved spreading tar on the subgrade placing a typical macadam layer, and finally sealing the macadam with a mixture of tar and sand. Tar grouted macadam was in use well before 1900 and involved scarifying the surface of an existing macadam pavement, spreading tar, and recompacting. Although the use of tar in road construction was known in the 19th century, it was little used and was not introduced on a large scale until the motor car arrived on the scene in the early 20th century. Modern tar macadam was patented by British civil engineer Edgar Purnell Hooley, who noticed that spilter on the roadway kept the dust down and created a smooth surface. 39. He took out a patent in 1901 for tarmac. 40. Hooley's 1901 patent involved mechanically mixing tar and aggregate prior to lay down and then compacting the mixture with a steamroller. The tar was modified by adding small amounts of Portland cement, resin, and pitch. 41. Controlled access highways. 
Historical map of the original A-9 motorway, Italy. The first motorway ever built in the world was opened on 21 September 1924. The first version of modern controlled access highways evolved during the first half of the 20th century. The Long Island Motor Parkway in New York opened in 1908 as a private venture and Waste World's first limited access roadway. It included many modern features, including bank turns, guardrails and reinforced concrete tarmac. 42. Modern controlled access highways originated in the early 1920s in response to the rapidly increasing use of the automobile the demand for faster movement between cities and as a consequence of improvements in paving processes, techniques and materials. These original high-speed roads were referred to as dual highways and, while divided, bore little resemblance to the highways of today. The first dual highway opened in Italy in 1924, between Milan and Ves, and now forms parts of the A8 and A9 motorways. This highway, while divided, contained only one lane in each direction and no interchanges. In New York in 1924, the Bronx River Parkway was opened to traffic. The Bronx River Parkway was the first road in North America to utilize a median strip to separate the opposing lanes, to be constructed through a park, and where intersecting streets crossed over bridges. 43, 44. The Southern State Parkway opened in 1927, while the Long Island Motor Parkway was closed in 1937 and replaced by the Northern State Parkway, opened 19 motorways. This highway, while divided, contained only one lane in each direction and no trade route. Horses in the Middle Ages. Public transport bus service hash history. Notes. Late 1992. Good. That was history of the train road transport. I'll try to do a kind of video about this if my language then is the weather is very fine. Should maybe go out and take a walk. Buy a bag of snacks maybe.